Hello and welcome to In the Making, a series of conversations from North Bennett Street School where we connect with a range of new voices, fields, and perspectives. Before we get into our conversation, we want to thank the many supporters that make our programs possible, including the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Holt and Bugby Company, and all of our corporate partners in craft. My name is Kristen Odell. I'm an NBSS staff member and host of In the Making. Here at NBSS, we are no strangers to the benefits of using our hands to make things, using our hands to learn, absorb information, and grow. Educator, author, and thinker Sarah Kuhn, with us here today, has spent her career researching this very thing. Professor Emerita in the Department of Psychology at UMass Lowell, with a PhD in Urban Studies and Planning from MIT, and a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy and Social Psychology from Harvard University, Sarah will explain how physical objects, hands-on making, active construction, and other elements of body and environment can enhance comprehension, memory, and learning for students. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, Kristen, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here speaking to uh, friends and supporters of the North Bennett Street School. I've been an admirer from a distance for a very long time. So this is really wonderful for me to be able to be here. I feel as if I'm among like-minded people. And I hope that in this hour, I can give people who are listening sort of ammunition to be even more confident about following the path of the maker uh, and its importance. Thank you, Sarah. I, oh, of course. <laughs> I mean, I feel as if I've always been a maker of some sort, certainly as a child playing with blocks and uh, hammering, nailing, um, sawing. I was lucky to have parents who thought a hammer and a saw were okay, appropriate gifts for a girl. So that was very, very lucky for me. And mm -hmm. I had a good time with that. But I never imagined that my um, making, my constructing things, my sewing, um, my knitting, things like that would ever have any kind of overlap with my professional life. So it's been a really surprising and gratifying development for me that uh, that they have come not only to intersect, but also to overlap so much. And I thought it might be useful for me to tell a little bit of my story about how that came to be. Uh, and in order to do that, I have a few slides I want to show. I'll try to go through them very quickly because I don't like to be the one who is speaking uh, and hogging all the, the airwaves. I've never liked lecturing in my college classes. Uh, so please, uh, Kristen, we've already talked about this, but I hope that you will jump in. I certainly will. You have a question. So this is sort of the origin story of my using physical materials in my college classroom. I was teaching a sustainable development course back in the day when very few people were teaching about this. Uh, so we were kind of making it up, my colleague and I making it up as we went along. I also had two young children and lots of obligations, committee obligations and a long commute. So my days were very busy. And this was back in the day when if I wanted my students to read something that wasn't from a textbook, I had to photocopy it and hand it out to them. So one morning I pulled into the parking lot at school all ready to have a great in-depth discussion of the reading that was assigned for that day. And I realized I had forgotten to give it out to my students. And there is just nothing deadlier than 75 minutes of trying to pull things out of students when you know it's not there because they haven't done the reading. But um, like many parents of young children, I had a tub of Lego in the back of my car. And I'd always been kind of curious about what would happen if I brought physical materials into my classroom? So this was an opportunity. This is a chance when I had really nothing to lose. And I 
had my students stand up and gather around a table in the classroom. And I told them to spend five minutes sketching out a sustainable town. Um, and they, they did that. We, and then we went around the table and each student talked about what they had built. And I had heard the happy buzz of conversation as they put things together. And I loved that. There was a kind of new energy in the room that was very exciting for me. But when hey. they went around, it was clear that they hadn't understood the lesson. You know, they'd made parking garages and... <laughs> And, and things well, uh, rather than public transportation. Mm. Uh, so, so it was a good lesson to me. And then I said, okay, let's here, here's my feedback on what you've built. Let's try again and try connecting your communities together. So they let did. me ask you a question. Yeah. What would what would have been the alternative mode of drawing these communities? What were the other tools they would have been using if not for uh, the Legos or forgetting the lecture that day? A great question. They wouldn't have been. We would just have talked about it. Mm. And one thing I learned from this class, actually from a different exercise, was that I could talk all I want about sustainable development and the things that people were doing. I could show films, but until I asked them to actually do something, make a project, it didn't really sink in that they could do something about it. And one student finally articulated that to me. And I thought that was when the penny dropped. You know, I really need to do project-based and hands-on learning so that my students can feel a sense of agency about mm -hmm. this. So I wanted to understand what was going on here. And this led me to try to find out more about the body and what gets called by scholars embodied cognition or embodied learning. This is a diagram actually, this little grotesque figure of the amount of each part of the body that is, the, the amount of each part of the sensory cortex in the brain that is mapped to each part of the body. So you see that the hands are more than 50% of the sensory cortex of the body. And so it's huge. We really evolved to think and learn with our hands and manipulate things. And discovering this really helped reinforce what I felt had been that initial insight with the making in the classroom. But this is the kind of classroom that I was teaching in. And you, when you walk into this classroom, everybody knows what they're supposed to do. Students are supposed to sit down, take out their notebooks or their laptops and sit quietly and look at the front of the room, uh, the sage on the stage and uh, just take notes and, and listen. I've come to call this traditional style classroom, the sensory deprivation chamber. And to me, it's just solid beige. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Very, very beige. It is just all beige. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I love this cartoon at, because when I discovered it, I had already started asking people what I met, well, you know, when and where do you get your best ideas? And I think in all the years of asking that, only one person has said, when I'm at my computer, and another person has said, when I'm at my desk. Now, I think, I mean, I do learn myself. I learn a lot about what I think by writing and reading and so forth. So I'm not denigrating that. But in terms of kind of breakthrough thinking, I think it's usually when we're in our bodies, when we're in nature, people say when I'm out for a walk or a run, when I'm swimming, I mean, when I'm waking up, when I'm falling asleep, things like that. So this slide has way more text than I like to show, but Kristen asked me to talk about the five myths about learning in college. And this is something that I hand out to my students on the first day of class, because I, in my classes, I'm doing something that's very unfamiliar to them. I'm having them build things very quickly in some cases, or do longer builds over a series of weeks. And I thought I owed it to them 
to explain to them what, what it is I'm up to. Um, so, you know, we think that learning takes place inside our brains. Um, and that's all we need in order to think clearly and well. That's just not true. I mean, we know now that we think with our hands as we explore the world. Uh, we think with our entire bodies as we reposition ourselves in the world to encounter the world, and even with the our immediate environments. Then college learning is about learning facts. Well, that's part of it, the sort of skill and drill part of education, not my favorite part of education, and especially now that uh, students have uh, search engines at their fingertips and so forth. Uh, some facts are very useful to have in your head, but they're not the most important thing. I think a lot of what you learn in from school also is, is dispositions. Um, and that takes us to myth three, which is about experiential learning. Now in higher education, experiential learning is used, that term is used to talk about internships, co-ops, experiences where you go off campus. But I say, like John Dewey, all learning is experiential. So you are always having experiences. And every time you learn something, you are having experiences. And as John Dewey said, one of the things you can learn is that you hate a subject. So if you have a bad experience with something, as I, for instance, did with my math education, uh, the more math education I had, the more I disliked math, but that didn't have to be that way. There would have been a different way of giving me much more constructive experiences, and I'm still in math recovery. Sarah, when you referred to disposition in relation to experiential learning, what's what are you referring to? What are you connecting there? Oh, gosh, just, you know, inclinations, preferences, um, hmm. It's a good oh, just just as you said, so disposition. So if you you despise math, then you're just you're, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, missed, yeah, yeah, I okay. think so. I mean, I don't have a more formal definition of that well, word. That's so. good. <laughs> okay. That's good. <laughs> so uh, we also have the myth that by the time you get to college, you're an abstract thinker, and in some domains, that's probably true. Um, that you've become experienced enough in certain subjects that you can think about it abstractly. But, and I think we get this idea that somehow um, by the time you get to be the age of, of a college student, um, you are developmentally ready to think abstractly about everything. This comes from a misunderstanding of the work of child psychologists like Jean Piaget and his stage theory, but even he clarified uh, toward the end of his life that no, you become a more abstract thinker. It's sort of domain specific. So like I never studied music. And if I were to start studying music now, it would really help me to think with things as part of my music education. Um, and then, you know, to get so I could do it in my head. But we act as if college students and beyond, all, all adults can just do all these things in their head and that having manipulatives or things to think with are not really productive. And that's, that's a myth. And finally, this is a, such an important one. If you have trouble learning in college, it means there's something wrong with you. No, you know, college, our whole education system is built to favor book learning and certain types of learning and skills. And I'm sure this is not a surprise to the audience of, of this webinar. <laughs> we all experienced it in, in various forms. But, you know, that traditional classroom I saw you really creates disability um, more because it prevents us from using our hands and our bodies, which is how we evolved to learn, it's really disabling us as if making us learn with one hand tied behind our back, so to speak, or maybe two hands. Um, and I think that's one of the saddest things about what we've done. Now, I'm not an enemy of book learning, 
but I am one of the survivors of that system. And I think the people who teach in college, especially, uh, we're all the survivors of that system. We're the people who were able, you know, who either liked that system or were able to be successful within it despite its shortcomings. So I want to do a little bit of a digression now because I got so excited as I was looking a little into a little bit of the history of the North Bennett Street School. Um, because I, I have a whole, I wrote a book about thinking with things in college. It was the book that I wanted to, the book that I hoped I would find when I was exploring these things in the early days and it didn't exist. So I had to make it myself. So it took a while. But um, I have a whole chapter about uh, these kindergarten materials. It's this book, everyone. It's right here. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> it's fabulous. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so Friedrich Fribel was a German educator and scientist. And he sort of waffled back and forth between those two things. Although I would say he really kind of combined and, and integrated them, he started a system of educating young children, which he called kindergarten. Uh, and we still have that name today, although very few people still use the Froebel system. And he developed a number of special materials to be used by young children. The best known are these blocks, uh, but there are others as well. Um, and the reason that it ties into North Bennett Street School is because uh, a Bostonian named Elizabeth Palmer Peabody was the first person in the United States to start an English language kindergarten. There were some German language kindergartens before that. She was the first in 1860. And then she, she was well underway with this when the founders of North Bennett Street School asked her to start a kindergarten at the school. Uh, and I think that the, um, the, the strong affinity of the kindergarten system and the things that North Bennett Street School was founded to advance and still advances. There's, there's a very powerful affinity there. Mm -hmm. So there were also sewing cards, like punched cards that you could use for sewing. And there's a wonderful book called Inventing Kindergarten, sort of a coffee table book with lots of great images that argues that kindergarten had a huge influence on modern artists of the 20th century. So in the upper left is um, a sewing card from a kindergartner, maybe, I think it may be a kindergarten teacher illustrating how to use these materials. And then in the lower left, um, Mondrian, um, a Mondrian. Um, on the right, in the center, we have another sewing card and on the left, a work of art by Paul Clay. Now we know that Mondrian and Clay and quite a number of other artists of the 20th century went to Froebel kindergartens. It was very widespread at that time. And I would argue that it seems very, there's a very strong case, circumstantial case to be made for the influence on their adult work. This is an illustration from a teacher's manual for kindergarten teachers. And I don't think it will surprise you to hear that Frank Lloyd Wright was very conversant with the kindergarten materials as a child. His mother received kindergarten training in Boston and used the materials at home with him. And he, there's a quote from him, uh, something he said late in life, uh, those blocks are in my fingers to this day. Um, I haven't heard anybody yet talk about the influence on 20th century science, but I believe it is, e there's an equally powerful 
case to be made. The problem is that biographies of famous scientists don't usually talk about what they did in kindergarten. But this is a picture of J. Robert Oppenheimer in the center and his younger brother, Frank, is off to the left. Um, Robert said that uh, two of his passions as a child were building with blocks and uh, studying minerals and crystals. Um, so and there, yeah. a complete side question, why is that? Why are um, biographies of in the science realm, why don't they go that far back? Just no, no information? I mean, I think it's hard to find out. And I think nobody thinks it's relevant. Hmm. You know, they think it's relevant, like what you did in college or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think making a case for very early childhood intellectual influences is is hard because I think children aren't thought to have intellects or something. <laughs> but, and the Oppenheimers were a German Jewish family and they went to Germany and there was a lot of this uh, stuff going on in Germany at the time. Of, in fact, Froebel um, worked with a very prominent crystallographer and the number of times I stumble across crystallography when I'm reading about the late 19th and early 20th century is kind of amazing. And I think his his blocks can be seen as being something like crystals too. Okay, and then Francis Crick, Watson and Crick, uh, who are credited with the discovery of the structure of DNA, famously built a model. So it's not just for kids learning, um, but working, thinking with things in science is super important. I think that's probably goes without saying, but there it is. So back to my classroom. Um, this is actually a colleague took this. This is his music education students working with Lego. He saw me work with Lego in my classroom and he has never looked back. He's still doing it like 20 years later. But if you look at the expressions on these students' faces, this really, to me, captures the way in which the atmosphere in my classroom was, was transformed by thinking with things. And in fact, in the background, you can see the posters that my students made. So that's another kind of making. It's making with text and images. Um, making doesn't have to be three-dimensional sculpture. Sarah, where do you think, or if did you learn from this music instructor how this play right here affected their time with their instruments or their time, you know, uh, studying harmony or, or what, whatever it was after this? It's a really good question. I don't know that much about that. So these were students who were specifically training to be music teachers. Mm. Um, and I know one of the things that this group was doing was asking students to invent new notational systems and also to make instruments out of found objects, you know, trash, things found around, two liter bottles, things, things like that. So they were actually trying to unsettle the, the knowledge that the students already had because all of them or almost all of them knew how to read music and they were conversant with conventional um, European American musical notation. So the idea that there could be other notational systems was probably something that they didn't know and mm -hmm. sort of unsettling that by uh, exposing them to new ways of representing sound. It reminds me of, um, you know, art class in middle school. One of my teachers um, uh, had us turn the, or uh, he turned the object upside down or it was something that we were copying, mm -hmm. um, turning it upside down so that the reference is gone and then you're just following the lines. It reminds me of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of my favorite quotes is from um, an, a woman from England. Um, who wrote a lot about creativity. And she talked about 
the interaction between person and object as what does this do? What can I do with this? And I love that. And I, I hope that artists in the audience and makers can relate to that. I mean, first you have to understand what it is you're dealing with and what its characteristics and properties are. And then you think about how you can use those affordances and constraints to communicate what you want to communicate through your making. Um, I, I soon started spreading the gospel in faculty development workshops. So this is one example of, of a faculty development workshop that I'm doing. And in fact, uh, as Kristen knows, I'm coming to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I'm um, giving two presentations in the next 24 hours to people who are doing faculty development at universities, colleges, and so forth, and trying to persuade them to support faculty in thinking with things in their classroom. Um, the woman on the left with the white hair is my friend Judy, and Judy and I actually wrote a paper together about thinking with things, teaching with things. And one of the things we did while we were writing the paper was to create a concept map with Tinker Toys as a way of collaborating on the ideas that we wanted to put into our paper. And just, just taking advantage of how reconfigurable all these things are and how we could do brainstorming and rearranging and so forth. So it doesn't have to be Lego, almost any material um, including some digital materials, are amenable to this sort of treatment. I just throw this in because I want to talk about how having students represent things in various ways is, is important. Kristen, you talked about the art class, you know, turning something upside mm -hmm. down. Um, and the music teacher trying to unsettle his students' ideas of what musical notation was. I uh, only had one chemistry class and it didn't really stick, but I learned the periodic table that's on the left. But it turns out that there are many, many, many ways to represent the elements. And each representation emphasizes different things. So the image on the right comes from a book about all the many ways that one can represent the periodic table. and asking students to make their own representations, I think is very powerful uh, and a very effective way of learning. So give them craft materials or whatever uh, and let them play around. But Sarah, only, ba the yeah. periodic table, um, and you don't, you can go back or you don't have to, what's, this might be a tricky question, but what does the science community say about, um, you know, different configurations of this is that you know is that a, a big no-no or I mean outside of your work because we're pushing people to you know learn how to visualize things differently I, I hope maybe there's somebody um, who's part of this webinar who could weigh on in on that I have not I think there actually is the, so please Help us there's a there's a um there's a, a a guest on this program um who's a chemist and um the new science standards use modeling as a way to connect to their prior understandings and uh, this person references the periodic kingdom. Wow. Okay, I want to come so. to your class. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> this is great. I would love to know more. Thank we you. encourage you to say to to share more information, Barbara. <laughs> Good. Okay. Glad I'm not the only person thinking about this. So it really helps to have a space that supports this kind of learning. And I finally found a derelict storage room and persuaded the provost to turn it into a kind of studio space that would support studio learning for 
faculty in disciplines that didn't have a studio tradition. You can tell this was a very long time ago because of the antiquity of the uh, technology. I would do things a little differently now, but the point is, you know, having a big table for people to gather around, having lab benches and so forth is really supports thinking with things. But even if you do have that sensory deprivation chamber traditional classroom, put a cabinet in the corner and put your physical materials there. You know, I remember being nine months pregnant and schlepping overhead projectors up two flights of stairs and things like that. I'll also just note the difference in in contrast and color versus the beige classroom. I mean, even just the black and white contrast of white walls, black window frames, you know, yeah. um, it's a huge difference. And the plants, the plants were very mm -hmm. important to me. And I think just putting some plants in a classroom transforms it. We know that access to nature is really important to people. And um, it also is, I think, a signal to students that the place is cared for. Because if the plants are not dead, then somebody is there taking care of them. So I was always interested in how thinking with things can support learning particular concepts but what I discovered as I was exploring this is that sometimes physical materials that are not uh, linked to the subject matter in the class can also be beneficial in terms of helping students to pay attention. Uh, so I made this little assembly here and I called it the Boring Lectures Survival Kit. Um, it turns out that very low cognitive load manual activities like fidget spinning or um, knitting, if you are not trying to learn knitting, you know, there if you once you're an experienced knitter, you can kind of knit away or you can use a knitting spool, which is very simple, or this Japanese embroidery in the upper right hand corner or knot tying, any of those things, as long as you don't have to pay close attention to them. Um, can help you pay attention while you're listening to something, particularly something boring that might cause your mind to wander. So we're almost done. Um, I had to throw this image in because this is the Edna Lawrence Nature Lab at the Rhode Island School of Design. It's a really amazing space that was created a century ago. And I noticed that almost all the people I'm talking about, you know, the founders of North Bennett Street School and Elizabeth Palmer Peabody and so forth, and Edna Lawrence, were women of the progressive era. And she, um, she created this space. And I was teaching the making of crocheted hyperbolic planes, which I will explain in just a second. Um, in this space. And I just thought, you know, it's, this is a nature form. It doesn't get any better than this. It was delightful to be here. And you've probably already looked at the benefits that I've listed on the side, but this is uh, for the list that I give um, faculty when I'm talking about what benefit they can get from bringing this approach into their classroom. What does become the guide on the side mean? Oh, yeah, sorry, that's sort of um, higher education speak. So uh, in when talking about teaching methods, the conventional method is referred to sometimes by the nickname, the sage on the stage. Hmm. So that is uh, the person that all those desks that you saw at the beginning of my talk in the beige classroom, they're all lined up to listen to the sage on the stage, the professor who is the fount of all wisdom. But people who are trying to reform teaching in higher education sometimes talk about moving from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side, which is more of a coach. So you give your students things to do, and then you watch them doing them. As I watched my students 
making conventional communities when they were building with Lego in my first iteration there in the sustainable development class. So I got a chance to give them feedback and to coach them and then ask them to do it again. So that's what it is. Thank you so much for asking yeah. me that. Yeah, and it did, that experience also made their learning visible or in my case, their lack of learning so it gave me a chance. To... It's it's such a departure from that traditional, just the visual of, and I, I went to a music school, so I was not necessarily in that formal classroom structure, mm -hmm. but um, that visual of, um, you know, having all of the work be visible and the learning visible, it's such a contrast from the student behind the book, you never actually know what's going on, how the, and you know, what's the, what's the engagement happening? It's really something. Mm -hmm. So I said I'd explain about crocheted hyperbolic planes, and I will do that as briefly as I can with my limited knowledge. Um, it's a um, mathematical object, a model of a mathematical object that's made with a crochet hook and yarn. Uh, you could make it out of other materials. And in fact, there were mathematicians who were trying to understand this mathematical object, the hyperbolic plane, who were making models with paper and scotch tape and so forth, lots of cut out um, pieces of paper. And then uh, a new person joined them. Uh, she had grown up in Latvia, and if you're a girl in Latvia, you become good at knitting and crochet. And she realized that a much more robust model could be made um, by, by crocheting. And in so doing, she created this really evocative object that got many people who were not mathematicians excited about it. Uh, some people looked at it and said, oh, this looks like coral, or this looks like the brain. <laughs> and in formal mathematical terms, it's a surface of constant negative curvature. And if anybody wants to know more about that, I'm happy to explain. But I also have a second website that is devoted to hyperbolic crochet. So that could be a good way to, to know more. And we're putting those links in the chat for folks to read more about the um, hyperbolic planes. Right, and and I did also bring along I, uh, one to, to show because a hyperbolic plane in motion is much more interesting than the static hyperbolic plane. Um, I'll just say, I won't make you guess, but I'll say sometimes I ask people what's the ratio of the tan or gold color to the reddish color in this. And people have all kinds of guesses, but the answer is one to one, which is kind of shocking because it wouldn't be true. Uh, you know, the cir circumference is just very, very large because of the shape of, of this, so. It, I, I get that, yeah. <laughs> How, so when you, I mean, um, surely you've made hundreds of those? I've lost count, yeah. And what is your sensory activity with that object? Is it the act of making it, or do you uh, do you then do you play with them also? Do you feel hand feel? Great question. I mean, my evolution was from reading a book about crocheted hyperbolic planes to um, learning to make them and then giving them away and so forth. I the making for me, because I've made so many has become very low cognitive load. So if I want a low cognitive load manual activity, I could just sit there and make a crocheted hyperbolic plane mm -hmm. while listening to something that is not fully engaging. So, and the making, the experience of making is also really interesting because it starts as a circle and then it grows out and out and out as you work on it from the center of the circle. And then the edges begin to buckle and um, a colleague pointed out to me that this is an illustration of the systems theory principle of emergence in which uh, 
small identical or individual identical elements combined together to form something that's very different. And one of the classic examples is a flock of birds. You get a flock of 500 birds and together they fly in these sometimes crazy formations that dip and reconfigure and so forth. So mm. that's about as far as I can go with that. But yes, a, a, new, a new form emerges from repeating these very simple, extremely simple steps of crocheting. Mm. Thank you for that. I'm an uh, I'm a constant needle pointer, and the act of just the same the repetition of that mm -hmm. um, it it gets me to a place probably very similarly to what you're describing. Um, I have some questions, and to our guests, please now's your time. Um, give questions our way. I would like to discuss, um, and this is a tough conversation, really. Going back to the Froebel kindergarten materials, um, it's something that I would have never have known about until reading your book. Um, the connection, the research behind the Im its impact on modern art that you can see visibly in these great artists who studied this, um, this kindergarten method. So tying that into our hopes for our educational models of the future, um, you know, because we can see the effects of these young, you know, the, the educational systems for our young people 20, 30 years later, mm. what, you know, what are your hopes for educational models moving forward? And what's, you know, what are we to expect after the, the past three years of absolute virtual learning? You know, it's, it's an uneasy thought to think what's, what are the youth of right now going to be producing for us in 30 years? Mm -hmm. Those are great questions. Um, I've learned through hard experience not to make predictions, but, <laughs> but um, my hope would be that in addition to having students who can use technologies of the present and the future in a constructive way, we would also be sure that we were educating the, all of us who live in the physical world. Um, and the fact that we sort of, even when we talk about educational technology, I would say all the things I've shown are educational technologies, none of them plug into the wall. But in the professional conversation, about educational technology, it's always about digital technologies. And I think that we're we're missing something huge, and by the way, something very affordable and high impact by jumping over uh, the physical things that we could put into the classroom to advance pedagogy. Um, let's take advantage of those wonderful hands in our learning, even if your goal is to eventually create abstract thinkers in a particular domain, it really helps to start uh, at any age um, with th thinking with things as a launching pad for expertise in the future. So. I'm also thinking, I'm going back to your slide of the um, all of the fidget spinners or the, the just the activities and the fidget spinners specifically, there was a rush on them, you know, a few years ago. I think everybody on this call can remember when they just exploded and whether that was a reaction to um, more frequent testing of ADHD in our young people or that becoming more of a um an, an outwardly uh an, an outward piece of our lives um that became very public as kids dealing with adhd i we talked about it earlier that you know it's it's a quick fix and and we i also asked you what is you know how's your feel about the soft object versus this massive explosion of the plastic fidget spinner. <laughs> it's a travesty to our environment and probably to our children. 
I'll answer the second question first. I think a lot of it is just personal preference. I happen to like soft materials, yarn, textiles, things like that. I think that their affordances and just the textures and so forth to me are, are more evocative, more comforting and so forth. But I think the explosion of interest in fidget spinners was a, a wonderful red flag for us, an opportunity for us to learn that we were doing something wrong. Why do all these kids need fidget spinners? Why are they fidgeting? Well, it's because we're telling them to go sit down and sit still um, and listen to the teacher. And my students um, rarely need fidget spinners <laughs> in my classroom, I'll, I'll put it that way. I mean, colleagues at the in the academy complain about students being on their phones and so forth during class. That didn't happen in my class because their hands were engaged and their voices were engaged. Um, so it wasn't something that I really needed to worry about. In fact, uh, when when it came that every student had something in their pocket, sometimes I would ask them to take out their phone and to um, look up something on the web that had to do with something they were particularly interested in. Or if I had them build something with Lego that they then had to take apart and put away, I would say, okay, here's your photo opportunity if you want to take a picture of this, because that would be a way for them to save it. And often they had built something that was about you know, them as a learner or their aspirations for the future or something like that. And I wanted them to be able to have a record of it, even though they couldn't take the Lego itself back to their dorm room or back to mm -hmm. their... Sarah, from your perspective, what should colleges and universities prioritize to leverage embodied cognition in programs across content? I well, can... yeah, faculty professional development, I think. I think, um, first of all, just creating a permission structure to do this sort of work, because I was very much going against the grain um, in the work that I was doing in the classroom. In fact, I had one faculty member warn a, stu a grad student of mine against me because I was just playing with Lego. And it's fair, it's, it was fine, it worked. She, she knew, <laughs> she knew <laughs> what she was doing, fortunately. It didn't scare her away. Um, but yeah, I think, I think creating a permission structure, um, sponsoring, workshops, you know, letting people, giving people my book, uh, or there are now a couple of others also on this subject, I'm very happy to say, but just an, an endorsement by leadership that this is an okay thing to experiment with. Uh, and I'm doing workshops for faculty and for the people who run faculty um, teaching development centers. Um, putting cabinets in classrooms or even making, creating classrooms where people can make things is really important. Um, and then uh, the, another thing that I want to do uh, is create a curriculum bank for college teachers with ideas about how you can teach particular concepts in various disciplines using physical materials. So I really want to follow up on this chemistry thing. And I am I want to know more. I mean, chemistry is actually one subject that does sometimes in some classes, I think particularly intro to organic chemistry, use molecular models. Um, but just in support and endorsement and making this something that is considered OK uh, and reasonable to do in the academy. So my hope for my book was that it would help to create a permission structure for pursuing this. I, I always go back to your moment of brilliant improvisation when you were going into your classroom with no uh, textbooks for your students, no print-offs, and that one split moment where you decided to grab the Legos. Now, you said that you had um, experimented with this idea prior to that day, but how much of your own upbringing that you 
told us involves your parents being okay, putting saws and hammers and, you know, the tools in your hands. How much of that played into, you know, leading up to that moment where, I mean, as you've explained, it kind of was a direction and life-changing moment for you to pull the Legos out of your trunk and take them into your class. I, I think that I was feeling a lack uh, you know, I was also in the sensory deprivation classroom, mm. and it was beginning to tell on me. It was, I, I just had a feeling that it was not exactly what I wanted to be doing. And so, I don't know, there was some impulse there, and I certainly didn't imagine that this was going to be the pivotal moment that it turned out to be. Although I think, you know, if I try to trace this through my biography, there were probably many pivotal moments. People ask me when I finally finished the manuscript for my book, well, how long have you been working on this? And I thought, I really don't know how to answer that question. Maybe it goes back to the five-year-old who was, you know, building room-sized structures with blocks or hammering nails or something. Mm -hmm. Maybe it goes back to... Uh, you know, escaping from work in graduate school by doing a little bit of sewing on the side or or something like that. That's kind of why the 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 need to have these discussions sometimes um, shocks me because you know, our past, I think of my great grandmother who was not um, not traditionally educated, who was fifty percent Native American from the Peorian tribe and was not traditionally educated and all of her education came from sewing crocheting cooking using her hands for everything and and then i think of an artist i recently met um crystal lacouture who has who's making these gorgeous wooden beaded um uh, large-scale massive jewelry for your home house jewelry she calls it and mm -hmm. so the need is always there for us to have these tactile experiences and it's where we came from. So it always just shocks me. Thank goodness you are talking about it and writing about it, but it's just always a surprise that we have to talk about it, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the most disturbing things that I ever heard was talking with a preschool teacher in Western Massachusetts. And she said, some of my students know how to stack blocks on an iPad, but they don't know how to do it in real life. And I've seen some of the remnants of that in college students as well. Uh, and it's, we really have, uh, I think the ideal would be to have students who can do both and who can see the connection between the two. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of science, technology, engineering, and math in in the arts, uh, but we don't tend to think of it that way. We're, we think of them as sort of opposites. In my conversations with weavers, for example, some of the some weavers get into weaving because they are very mathematical, and there are aspects of weaving that are extremely mathematical in really interesting ways that don't just have to do with measurement and multiplication. And then there are others who are total math phobes um, and they both groups can weave. And I would love to see um, the, you know, have more conversations around that. I think that the fiber arts in particular, because that's one of my particular interests is a great way into STEM subjects in the same way that for me, the crocheted hyperbolic plane would have been a wonderful way into mathematics. And I was never given that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that possibility. I always thought math was about computation and you know fundamentally about arithmetic and nobody ever disabused me of that notion. So that's... We one of our faculty members here just asked me earlier um, about this topic. Is can you? Uh, he was a teacher, and now he's in this hand skills based universe that we live in here at North Bennett. Mm -hmm. He asked about if um, he was an English teacher before literature literature teacher in high school. Mm -hmm. Can you see this um, this physical model mode being used in in the literature 
area of learning, which is just sort of a flat, you know, it's all, it's language. And I think we discussed uh, this other, this critical fabulation idea. Um, it's new, but anyway, you can answer that question. Uh, yeah. Um, my strong conviction is that this can be used in every discipline. And there are a few disciplines already that do a lot of thinking with things, you know, laboratory science, for instance, mm -hmm. things, things like that. Um, and I would love to have conversations with teachers. So please, if you're listening to this and you are a teacher in any discipline, I'd love to have a conversation with you about how this could be enacted in your discipline. And I said already that one of my goals is to create a curriculum bank for sharing these ideas. But uh, so, but for me to answer that question, I'd really need to have a deep conversation with someone who really knows their field and ask them about what it is they're trying to teach and then brainstorm with them about it. But my, my sort of flip answer right now is that uh, I love magnetic poetry. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of magnetic poetry. And one day I whipped out my hot glue gun and I started gluing words onto Lego bricks. So I now have about 30 Lego bricks that have words glued onto the side of them. And I, you know, that's for me, that's sort of a, an inspiring thing to think with. I don't know what to do with that, but I bet uh, a literature teacher would, yes. would know how to <laughs> take it the, to the next step. A question from one of our, um, one of our guests, um, and I think we just, we actually raised this, so it's kind of answered, can weaving be a gateway craft to math? Uh, I think the answer is loudly uh, yeah. yes. Like, yeah. And not, you know, again, not just the calculations, but permutations and combinations, uh, the weaving patterns. Um, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we're at the top of our conversation. I just want to let everybody know that Sarah's website has, you can contact her directly through there and she encourages you to do so. Um, very collaborative. And thank you, Sarah, for being with us. This has been really wonderful. Thank and, you so much um, for the opportunity, Kristen. Yeah. And thank you to our guests for spending the afternoon with us. And we will see you all very soon. All right, take care.